My name is Lindsay, and at the time this whole debacle unfolded, I was a graduate student at a prominent national university. The story I'm about to relay to you happened over the course of a couple of months in 2005 and become a very transformative occurrence in my life. After five plus years of sharing apartments and houses with all sorts of folk, be it students or professionals, male and female, I found myself with a huge apartment, but no one to share it with. I'm not sure how this happened. It seemed to have simply ended up that way. I hurriedly made posts on Craigslist, the local paper's classified section, and any other online place I could. Then I printed up some flyers and pinned those up everywhere. Be it the board at school, the one at the laundromat, or the community board at Barnes & Nobles, I did my level best to paper the city with flyers. The way I figured it, I would need two more people to make the rent and live comfortably in the present apartment. That left us with a room to make whatever we wanted of it. Library, group meeting room, whatever we could all agree to. Although my name was the one on the lease, I tried to be fair with my other roommates. I didn't want to come across as a tyrant to others. I would lived in situations like that in the past and it made the living conditions uncomfortable and I got out of them as fast as I could. Thankfully, it wasn't long before I got my first call. The guy calling's name was Franklin, or Frank for short, and he had a pleasant voice and seemed truly interested in seeing the place, so we agreed to meet at the complex's community room the next morning. My reason for doing this was twofold. To ensure my safety in case he ended up being a wacko, he wouldn't know the exact apartment and would be less likely to assault me in a public place. I'm pleased to say that these precautions turned out to be unnecessary at this time. After completing college out west, he decided to move here because of the area's large number of publishing houses. Taking up writing in high school, his dream became to be the next F. Scott Fitzgerald. He'd always loved the free bohemian lifestyle that Scott, Zelda, and their friends got to live after they had become published authors. Fortunately for him, he was financially well off because of a check he received yearly from his grandfather's estate. After a few minutes of talking, I felt fairly confident this guy wasn't here to victimize me. The next step was to show him the place and see if he was still interested. I took him on a walk through the apartment and then we sat down to discuss money, my least favorite part of the whole thing. When I told him what his part would be, he didn't even flinch. I followed up by assuring him the amount would be less once we found another roommate and he seemed to still be unconcerned. He went as far as to tell me that he would happily pay the rent of two if this would make things easier for me. That seemed more than a kind offer, but I let him know that all the roommates would only be expected to pay their part and any extra would be absorbed by me. He said that was fine with him and after going over things for another half hour, he told me he was still interested and handed over his deposit and first month's rent. It had all gone so smoothly I was shocked. We shook hands and made plans for the day and time he could move in. And that was it. I could only hope the second roommate was as easy to please. Not everyone was independently wealthy and so easy going. Of course, I went through the motions of calling his references. Those on the other side of the phone all gave him glowing recommendations. So glowing, they made him sound like Mr. Rogers. I couldn't be more pleased. They had made me even more confident in my choice. When the day came, he arrived at the door with only two duffel bags and a laptop. I asked when he would be bringing the rest of his things, but he said that was it. My only thought was, man, he's really taking this bohemian lifestyle thing to heart. Since there were still no other roommates, I told him he was free to choose any of the three remaining rooms. He pondered his choice for a moment and took the one across from mine. I thought nothing of this at the time. It was the second biggest after all and truthfully, it's the one I would have chosen most likely. Life with my new roommate was far easier than I'd experienced in the past. Each trip to the market, he insisted on paying for everything. Despite my half-hearted attempts to refuse, he wouldn't take no for an answer. His reasoning was that we deserved to eat well because we both worked so hard. Besides, since it was just the two of us, it wasn't that much anyways. This sentence gave me pause. He made it sound like we were a couple. I thought for a moment. Had I given him a reason to think this? Had I flirted or said something in passing? Nothing came to mind. I must have just misunderstood his meaning. He'd never attempted to get physical with me, and surely 
he had to know that I was into girls. I quickly put it out of my mind and went on with my day. I never really understood how men thought anyways. About a month in, we decided to have a small get-to-know people housewarming party for him. I invited a few friends from work and people I knew from the complex. It wasn't a massive undertaking. Only about 15 people were invited and out of that, only 8 showed up. Frank made sure we brought plenty of alcohol and food. The night turned out to be a roaring success and everyone seemed to be having a good time. Frank ordained himself the official bartender and wowed me with his extensive knowledge of mixed drinks. The show started to wind down at about 1am and we spent the next hour cleaning up empties and other assorted party refuse. When we were done, I fired up the dishwasher and sat down on the couch to rest. Soon after, Frank joined me on the couch. I could tell he was still pretty out of it. We sat and discussed how well the party had went and he mentioned how cool all the people he met were. I'm not sure what I was about to say, but before I could, Frank leaned over and kissed me on the lips. Since it wasn't something I expected, I was understandably very shocked. I wasn't really sure what I should say to him. He just sat there, staring at me with a crooked smile. I realized this was something I would have to nip in the bud before it went any further. Despite drinking, he likely did have some sort of feelings for me and considering we had to live together, it had to be addressed right now. My goal was to make it clear that I liked him as a friend, but we could never have more than a friendship because I wasn't into men. Me turning down his advances was nothing personal. He was a good guy, good looking, but I just wasn't attracted to men. I said I was sorry if he was embarrassed. I didn't mean to hurt his feelings. He said and did nothing except look down and say, Yeah, sure. After he did that, he tromped off to his room like an angry little kid. I was still buzzing myself a bit and very tired so I decided to call it a night. Hopefully Frank would pout in his room for a while and then pass out. Then we'd be able to talk about the whole thing in the morning when we both had clearer heads. I couldn't have been sleeping very long. For some reason, I woke up choking and was unable to breathe. I first thought that I was choking on my vomit, but I knew that was unlikely. I hadn't had that much to drink. Once I opened my eyes, I realized Frank was sitting on top of me, trying to choke me. Because of my nightlight next to my bed, I could see his face. There was no expression whatsoever. No anger, no sadness, nothing. If by instinct my body began to fight to get free, but regardless of my kicking and slapping, he continued to choke me. Right as I began to lose hope, I remembered a thing my father told me as a girl. You go for a man's eyes like poke them out or something like that. Nobody's going to be able to hold on to you. He's going to grab for his eye. It's just human nature. You can cut some SOB's eye out with those claws you got. I realized I had nothing to lose, so I did it. I reached for his right eye socket and jammed my thumb into it. It didn't take long before I felt the eyeball pop out, and sure enough, he grabbed for it, and that was my chance. He stood up next to the bed screaming with his right hand over the socket holding it as blood poured down his face. I couldn't help but cough over and over, but I knew the eye thing wasn't going to keep his attention forever. So I grabbed my phone from my nightstand and ran into my bathroom. Slamming and locking the door, I dialed 911 and hit enter. He began beating on the door and attempting to get in almost before I could lock the knob. I guess he heard me yelling at the 911 operator because the beating and screaming quickly stopped. The operator kept me on with her until the cops arrived. I'm glad she did because it helped me keep my mind off my agonizing throat. The officers had me relay a description of Frank to them. They had a couple of more units searching the neighborhood for him. I assured them he would be hard to miss. Odds were against them that they'd encounter another guy with his right eye hanging out. It wasn't long before I heard the call on their radios saying Frank had been found. The car carrying him brought him back to the complex for me to give them a visual confirmation and, of course, they had the right guy. Frank wouldn't look at me. He was looking down, still holding his hand over the dangling eyeball. Once I had confirmed, they took him away to the hospital and I would soon follow in the back of an ambulance. Fortunately, they weren't able to save the eye. I've done too much damage to it. Not only had I pulled it out, my long nails had managed to slice it up. He hadn't been able to do a whole lot to me, 
My eyes looked like the whites were full of blood, which I guess they were. In addition to the bloodshot eyes, it was hard to talk for a while and my neck had hand-shaped bruises on it. My voice sounded like some old woman that had smoked camel straights for a thousand years. But overall, I got out relatively okay physically in the long run, but mentally, things weren't so peachy. My path down the road to peace had been a long one and I don't see things ever going back to the way they used to be. When it comes to the case, Frank took a plea and, in all likelihood, won't be out until he's 50. His lawyer assured him he would certainly get a much harsher sentence from a jury considering his prior record and reputation. And yeah, about that. His whole nice guy aspiring writer in Love by All Things was a giant fraud. Back where he's from, he was in equal parts feared and hated. He'd been in and out of trouble with the law since he was 12. And the only reason he had received such glowing references from everyone was he had threatened them and their families. They had been more than happy to get him out of their city and away from them. Basically, he was the town bully. The craziest thing out of this super crazy story was that he did receive yearly checks from his grandfather's estate. The old man had invented paper clips or something crazy like that. The whole family was drowning in money. The problem why he turned into such a psychopath, he grew up thinking he owned everyone in the small town he lived in. As for me, it took almost being killed to realize I didn't need to live with a group of strangers to meet people. I finally got rid of that big apartment and moved into a cozy one bedroom. If I felt the need to socialize, my neighbors were happy to visit with me a while and talk. One of my neighbors turned out to be a wonderful guy, and we actually got married five years ago and are more than happy sharing a modest three-bedroom house with our son. When it comes to the long-term effects of the attack, my voice is a tad gruffer than it used to be and therapy is still a big part of my life. However, I try not to let those things get me down. It could have all ended that night with Frank's hands wrapped around my throat. Since this is a recent story, the pain stemming from it is still very strong. After reading this, you'll understand why. Being a poor person without insurance, my boyfriend and I, of course, are unable to afford counseling. Besides, I doubt he would be willing to do it anyway. Despite the fact that his constant facade of strength often gets in my nerves, at this point, I realize one of us has to be the strong one in the relationship and that is certainly not me. Following a discussion with my sister, I decided committing this story to paper may serve as some form of therapy. Before I get to the heart of my story, I must tell you how we got there. My boyfriend Mike and I had only recently moved to Arkansas because of a transfer he'd received at work. This transfer also came with a raise and promotion. It came at a perfect time considering I had also just discovered I was pregnant. I got a part-time job at a bookstore so we could have a little extra pocket money. It also gave me an excuse to get out of the house once in a while. Having no friends, I'd go crazy sitting at home all day while Mike was at work. When it came time to quit because of the impending birth, they assured me if I wanted to come back in the future, there would be a job for me. I thanked them, but I had no intention of working another job until our son started school, at least maybe longer. The big day came and after 10 hours of sheer exhausting pain, our beautiful boy was born. By the time Mike Jr. and I got to go home, Big Mike had to go back to work. Since he was a supervisor, he was free to make his hours and take off for the days as long as he was no longer needed. He would often come home for lunch and take an hour off to spend time with his newborn son and help me out if I needed it. Life in our home was darn near idealistic for near on a year. That was until the company laid Mike off. Although he was receiving unemployment, it came nowhere near to making up for what we had lost. For a moment, I considered returning to the bookstore, but since Mike and I had always disagreed with childcare, we decided against it. The following weeks were a trying time until we realized a sure, steady source of income was looking us right in the eye. We remembered we had a guest house. This wasn't exactly your stereotypical guest house, full of lavish furnishings and the like. It was actually a converted pool house slash shed that the landlords had converted for their teenage son to live in. Not a palace by far, but 
nice enough for a single young person. We'd been using it for a storage place for old baby things and we'd find another place for that stuff if it meant we could create another source of income and that's just what we did. We sat down to brainstorm what the wording of the ad would be and after three hours of back and forth, this is what we came up with. Young, friendly couple with newborn son looking for a single female under 30 to rent guest house, $300 a month, may need to babysit on occasion, call with our number, 7am to 9pm. Mike wasted no time in posting it. It was put in the usual places like our local newspaper and Craigslist. Once it was up, we had to do the hard part and wait. Fortunately for us, it didn't take long. The first few calls came from stupid little boys pretending to be girls. I guess because they thought it was funny, but the next morning was when Charlie called. Charlie was a 23-year-old girl from Fayetteville that worked at Golden Corral. Lucky for her, the location she worked at was only about a 15-minute drive from our place. So far, so good. She went on to say she had been single for almost a year and had no intention of changing that anytime soon. Her father was a preacher in Fayetteville and her mother had been a nurse before she passed away from breast cancer 10 years ago. From what I could tell on the phone, she seemed to be a quiet and down-to-earth girl. After speaking to Mike, we decided to invite her to see the place. She showed up the next afternoon after her lunch shift at work. We all sat at the dining room table and discussed exactly what we expected of her and she seemed pleased with everything. After we showed her around the guest house, we left her alone for a moment to make up her mind. Just a minute later, she returned to tell us she wanted to rent the place and we all shook hands to seal the deal. In order to ensure her spot, she gave us $150 for a deposit. When we all found a day we were all free, we set the Friday up for her to move her stuff in. We took her into the nursery and introduced her to Mike Jr. They took to each other right off. All things looked to be on their way up and I was able to relax a bit for the first time in quite some time. Friday afternoon came and Charlie arrived at 2. Mike and I helped her move her few pieces of furniture into the guest house and we were done by 4. To celebrate, I cooked a big dinner of spaghetti and garlic bread. We all ate well and Mike and I decided to call it an early night and turned in around 9pm. The next few weeks carried on as normal and Charlie would join us sporadically for dinner. She even offered to babysit for us one evening so we could go see a movie together. From all appearances, she was a model renter and we all got along well. About a month and a half after moving in, I asked Charlie if she was free to babysit that evening so Mike and I could visit a family member that was in the hospital in Fayetteville. She said she was more than happy to do it, so we left that day around 5pm. We took our time visiting our loved one and decided to stop off and get some takeout. While we were at the restaurant, we picked up some food for Charlie also, as a way to say thanks. When Mike pulled into the driveway, we noticed that Charlie's Subaru was gone. This struck me as strange since it was there when we left, and she was supposed to be home watching Mike Jr. With some bit of trepidation, I entered the house and soon realized one of my darkest fears. After a 30-minute frantic search, we were forced to finally acknowledge the truth. Charlie had kidnapped our son. I must have called her phone 30 times but never got an answer. Mike did most of the talking to the police. Every time I started to say anything, I'd lose control of myself and yell, please find my baby, and break down crying. He gave the authorities every bit of information we had on Charlie, but unfortunately, most of it was a lie. It wasn't until the next morning the police discovered Charlie's real identity. Apparently her real name was Rose, and she had only been in Fayetteville for a few months. She had moved there from Missouri where she was living with her boyfriend and their newborn son. The whole situation gave me the chills because of its similarity to Mike's and my life. Sadly for her, their son died soon after coming home from unknown causes, but the medical examiner thought it was most likely SIDS or son and infant death syndrome. I had a brief pang of sympathy for her, but my anger quickly drowned it out. The police had brought in the FBI soon after they discovered the true identity of Charlie. The prevailing theory was that she would either return to Missouri or head to Kansas where her mother was currently living. More than likely, she would head to Kansas. 
Her mother had a history of helping her daughter out of jams with the law and the feds hoped they could convince her to give Charlie up if she contacted her. There had been a couple of reported sightings of her and little Mikey, but they had been in two different directions. A week into the search, I was beginning to lose hope and, as a result, my grasp on my own sanity was slipping. Many times a day I found myself begging God to bring my baby home. I had never been a very religious person, but you put in circumstances like this, you learn how easy it is to become connected to him and how much belief has to do with comforting oneself in trying times. Thankfully, that following week the feds called us and said that Charlie had contacted her mother and she was making her way to her. Charlie told her that she had been moving very slowly, staying in various places for days at a time and driving only at night. When her mother asked her if Mike Jr. was okay, Charlie assured her that he was fine and she would never harm him. When the cops told us this part particularly, I felt relieved. A small part of me was afraid that she had done something terrible to Mike Jr. out of spite, spite against all of us women with healthy living children. In order to gain her trust, Charlie's mother had told her to stay away from her house. The police were watching her place. Instead, she had rented a motel room for her on the outskirts of town and when she was able to get away, she'd come see her. Charlie bought the story, and once she had checked into the motel, the cops waited for their opportunity to strike. Later that night, they saw their chance and took it. Around 11 p.m., she stepped away from the room to get some ice. Mike Jr. was alone in the room, so they had no fear of harming him during the arrest. When returning from the ice machine, the cops approached her from all directions and arrested her with no problem. The moment the FBI had called us and told us their plan, the local detective volunteered to drive us up to Kansas so we could be there when Mike Jr. was saved. We had been waiting at another motel just a few miles away waiting to get the okay to pick him up and at 11.15 that night, we were finally reunited with our beautiful baby boy. The paramedics were on the scene to check him for any injuries and as we'd hoped, he was fine. I could see Charlie sitting in the back of a cop car the urge to scream at her and ask her why almost overwhelmed me, but in the end, I guess we already knew why. Once the trial finally began nearly a year later, the true extent of Charlie's, or Rose's, whatever you want to call her, plan was brought to light. She claimed that she had no intention of kidnapping anyone's child when she came to Arkansas. Her only desire was to start her life over and move on from her son's death, but when she saw the ad, the idea of taking Mike Jr. started to form. When she saw him, she fell in love, and that was it. Of course, she said she felt bad about doing it to us because we had become like her friends, but her love for Mike Jr. and her grief over her own loss overruled her mind. Despite her multiple attempts to get the jury's sympathy, she was found guilty. In order to ensure she would receive the harshest sentence, the local DA chose to let the feds try her and as a result of this, she was given 20 years. You better believe that Mike and I will be at every one of her parole hearings to make sure she serves every day of that 20 years. Well, that brings us back to the present. I'm sorry if at the beginning of this I may have given you the impression that my child had passed. That was not my intent. While I recognize that losing a child permanently is a far worse thing, I hope at least a few of you out there can understand the constant fear that I live with every day and if it's something you can carry with you too long, you can become unhinged. While I may not be the happy-go-lucky girl I once was, sharing my story with all of you has lifted a small weight from my heart. My greatest hope is that Mike Jr. was far too young to be harmed by this painful episode and he can grow up to be a well-rounded and happy man. Mike and I have done our best to carry on as before dealing with our pain and fears the only way we know how. If not for the good of ourselves, certainly for the good of our son. The story I'm about to tell is not as scary as it is sad, but don't be fooled. There were many moments during this time that I was scared out of my mind. Although I'm here to put some fear into readers, it's also a great opportunity to educate everyone on the dangers related to a common milady. So, turn out the lights and get comfortable. Here comes my scary tale of the nicest 
but creepiest roommate I've ever had. Upon graduating high school, my parents hit me with the ultimatum, you're a man now, it's time you start paying us rent or move out and get your own place. Heck, I wasn't about to pay my folks to live with them, so the hunt for an apartment started immediately. Fortunately, I had a job for a couple of years, so I had some money saved up. I think my parents thought I would choose to stay at home and they'd be able to get a piece of it, but I'd been looking for an excuse to get away from them and they gave it to me. It wasn't long before I found a place with a friend of mine riding his couch. This wasn't my long-term plan, of course, but it gave me a chance to get away from my parents. Within that month, I found a guy from work who had just been forced to kick his roommate out of their place for not paying as part of the rent. This dude was really cool and possibly the kindest guy I'd ever met, but he wasn't a pushover. We talked about each of our predicaments and decided I would take his former roomie's place, and it's where I would stay until just recently. We got along great, probably because we were a lot alike, and it also helped we work different shifts. Our days off were spent on the couch playing Halo and throwing down many bottles of beer. Drug tests at work prevented us from enjoying things of an herbal variety, but we managed to have a good time anyway. Nothing out of the ordinary happened for the first few months, but one night, I got a shock of a lifetime. I had crashed out early one night after working a 12-hour shift, the third of that week. I'm not sure what the time was, but at some point, a loud banging at my door drew me from my sleep. In a slow and groggy state, I rolled over to see what had caused it. That's when I came eye to eye with my roommate. I was so shocked I could have jumped out of my skin. After taking a second to catch my breath, I yelled at him. Dude, what? But the reaction I expected never came. Turning on my overhead lamp, I still received no feedback. Utterly confused, I walked up to him and stared directly at his face. He just looked ahead standing like a statue, saying nothing. This is when I realized that he must be sleepwalking. Although I considered waking him up, I seemed to have remembered that you weren't supposed to do it, so I slowly turned him around and walked him back to his room. When we got there, I told him to go to bed, and believe it or not, he did. Very pleased with myself and still horribly tired, I went back to my room and locked the door. The rest of the night was happily uneventful. The next time I saw him, which was about two days later, I timidly mentioned it to him. I was unsure if he was even aware he did it, and I didn't want to embarrass him. To my relief, he was well aware of his condition. <laughs> yeah, man, uh, it's something I've been doing since I was a kid. Like most things in his life, he was able to laugh it off. He did, however, apologize for scaring me and assured me that I handled it the right way. I more than likely wouldn't have been able to wake him up anyway. In the future, he would be sure to lock his bedroom door and suggested I do the same. There was no guarantee it would keep him in or out, but it was worth a shot. I'd had no other run-ins with my zombie roomie for another four months, and when I did, I handled it the same way as I had before. After thinking about it for a while, it seemed stupid to get mad about the situation. It wasn't something he could control. Besides, there were certain protocols I could take to keep him out of my room at night, and once I did, I never received another nocturnal visit again. Sadly, by the end of that year, it would cease to be a worry in either of our lives. On December 3rd, I had only just returned from a three-day vacation, a vacation my boss had forced me to take because I was grossly over-accrued on my vacation time. I didn't tell him, but I was hoping to combine that time with the other three days I had coming so I could drink all the way through the holidays till January 3rd. Since my plans had been ruined, my mood was on the bad side. I was vegging out on the couch when I got a phone call from work. The moment I saw the number on my phone, it put me in an even worse mood, but I decided to answer it in case it was my roommate that was the one calling. Is your roommate there? He hasn't shown up for work today. Unfortunately, it was my boss. I was quick to remind him in the kindest way possible, of course, that I was not his mother and I had not seen him in a few days. My boss asked me to check his room and see if he was still sleeping, and I did because he was my boss, but he was nowhere to be seen. His bed was still messed up, which was strange. His anal retentive nature would never let him leave the house without making it. 
I promised my boss I'd call him if I heard from him, and I hung up. As soon as I hung up, I called my roomie, but got no answer. Doing the only thing I could, I left a message and went on with my day. There was still no return calls that evening. It really was unlike him to drop off the map like this, but he must have had his reasons. The next morning, I checked in on his room to see what time he'd finally came back, but everything still looked as it had the day before. It was definitely a head-scratcher. This type of behavior was very unlike him. You never know, though. I'd only known him a couple of years. Maybe he had a dark side I'd never seen. Shortly before I left the apartment for work, my phone rang. I checked the caller ID. It was a number I didn't recognize, but then an idea hit me. He must have lost his phone. And I answered it, trying not to laugh at him. Is this Anthony Curtis? The voice on the other end was not who I expected. I said yes, and his next question was if I was a friend of my roommate, and I answered yes once again. Before he could ask me another question, I asked him one. Who are you and what do you want? His answer threw me for a loop. I'm sorry, Mr. Curtis. My name is Detective Jones with Littleton Police Department. I'm afraid your roommate, Daniel Grant, has been in an auto accident and I regret to inform you he passed away at the hospital in the early hours of December 3rd. All I could say back to him was, What? Shock could not begin to describe what I felt in that moment. I guess I had gone silent because at some point I heard him saying, Hello, are you still there? After I took a deep, jagged breath, I was finally ready to answer him. Yeah. I'm here. What happened? Where did this occur? I was full of questions. He should have been in his room at that time sleeping, not in public. I continued to ask the cop questions. All we know at this time, sir, was that he was involved in a single car crash. He collided with a power pole as he ran off the road. His next series of questions would begin to unravel the mystery. Are you aware of any reason why Mr. Grant should have been on the road that time of night? I told him, oh, That's the strange thing. He should have been home sleeping. He had work that afternoon. He had never went out at night regardless. Well, it was strange that he was driving only wearing his boxers. That's when the whole thing clicked into place. I think I understand now, detective. He was a sleepwalker. He must have been driving in his sleep. Our discussion continued for a few minutes longer, and then I made the terrible call to his parents to notify them of the accident. They drove into town from Pueblo the next day. The arrangements were made to return his body to Pueblo, and the date and time of the funeral was set for three days later. Just to show how loved he was by everyone who knew him, our supervisors halted all work for that day to allow everyone to attend the funeral. I'm not a fan of funerals overall, but this was one I would never have dreamed of missing. Sending my best friend off right was the least I could do for him. The complete facts of the story were soon released, and it seemed to have played out just as I feared. Danny had sleepwalked his way out of his locked bedroom door, out to his car, and down the road. I had no idea sleepwalking could go this far, but after a discussion with my doctor, I learned how serious the condition could become. Despite the fact neither of us had any idea of how dangerous his sleepwalking could be, I can't help but feel a small amount of guilt in relation to his death. Maybe if we had done some research, we could have put some safeguards into place. But honestly, how safe would a pair of two 20-year-olds really have been? One of us probably would have passed out after a long night of video games and drinking and left the doors unlocked. The fact is, Danny's death was a freak accident, plain and simple. I stayed in our apartment for a couple of years more and just recently decided to let it go once my girlfriend and I found a house to rent together. I guess I stayed around so long without finding another roommate because it would have made his death more real. My girlfriend and I would often do the same things Danny and I did on my days off, and it was almost as fun as the old days, but in the end, I realized as long as I stayed in that apartment, I would never truly be able to accept he was gone. So last month, the decision was made to pass the place on to another pair of young guys from work. 
They had been having a hard time finding a place to rent and since I'd been in their position not that long ago, it was the right thing to do. I truly hope they have as much fun in that place as Danny and I did and that their friendship doesn't end in such a tragic way as ours. In my younger years, I had a bit of a substance problem and most of my friends did too. Once I'd started, it wasn't long before my parents kicked me out of the house. I don't blame them. If my kids were stealing everything that wasn't nailed down to sell for dope, I'd have done the same. I started out on the streets, but I was soon helped out by a couple of friends of mine that had a place in a trailer park. Larry and Shonda had been together for at least 10 years, and that whole time their relationship had been more volatile than a meth lab. In the brief time I stayed with them, I must have seen them beat the crap out of each other at least once a week. I could never figure out if the fights were caused by the dope or if it was just the way their friendship was. Everyone who knew them chose not to get involved because the one time somebody did, they were attacked by both of them. Let them kill each other, I don't care, was the attitude of most, but no one truly meant it. Unfortunately, they almost did many times, but the last fight proved to go farther than any had before, much farther. I'd lived on their couch for about two months when it happened. We spent most of our days separate or together, trying to figure out ways to hustle up some money to score. I'd been working odd jobs with another friend of ours for the last two weeks. Whether it was removing window air conditioning units from windows for old folks or painting people's mailboxes, we did it. On recycling days, I'd steal a grocery cart and go around neighborhoods picking up bottles and cans to cash in for money. I did alright, and I only had to work for a few hours each morning to do it. Shonda and Larry usually worked together as a team. Their hustles were usually illegal, but on occasion, they'd lower themselves and beg on street corners or downtown. However, though, they'd usually steal things from stores and then sell those same things to certain people that wanted them. Kind of like ordering things from a friend and then selling those things to you for half price, sometimes less. It was definitely a prolific deal, but the dangers of getting arrested were too high for me. Kicking is terrible anytime, but in jail, it's the worse. I'd prefer my freedom, thank you. All three of us had an exceptionally good day, so we scored more than usual. I'd just taken a handful of pills about an hour before and I was sprawled out across the couch enjoying my high. Shonda and Larry had gone in their room at some point to do who knows what. I'd been nodding in and out for God knows how long when I was slapped back into reality by a blood-curdling series of screams. Not the usual kind like when they fought, but the kind you hear in a horror movie. I was so whacked out I wasn't sure what was going on. All I know is I was scared out of my mind. The screams lasted for a good 20 seconds before everything went quiet. About a minute later, Shonda and Larry's bedroom door flew open so hard the knob banged into the wall. I could hear Shonda crying and mumbling to herself at the other end of the hall. Since I had zero idea of what had happened, the only thing I could figure out to do was pretend I was asleep, so that's just what I did. I never got involved in their drama before and this probably wasn't the right time to start. I picked up a blanket from the end of the couch, pulled it over me and closed my eyes. The sounds of her footsteps came echoing down the hall. My only fear was that she would attack me in my sleep, but I kept playing possum as she got closer. Finally, her steps stopped, and I could hear her heavy breathing behind me. The wait was agonizing, but I didn't move. After what seemed like an eternity, her steps started again and continued until I heard the front door open and close. I exhaled so loudly I was afraid for a moment that Shonda would hear me through the door and come back in, but she didn't. Her leaving in no way relieved my fear. I sat up and started thinking through what I believed had happened. I had originally thought those screams were coming from Shonda, but the more I analyzed it in my head, they may have come from Larry. So with a large amount of hesitation, I headed down the hall. I stopped almost immediately because what appeared to be bloody footprints were laid out before me. Despite the blood, I knew I had to see what I had to see to see what was up. Continuing down the hall, trying to avoid the blood, I finally arrived at the open bedroom door. Slowly raising my eyes till I reached the bed, his blood-covered body laid completely still on the bed. As it got closer, 
I realized his nude upper body was riddled with wounds. Trying not to yell out, I put my hand over my mouth to let out a muffled whine. Regardless of how dirty my life had been, I'd never seen anything close to as awful as this. Larry was beyond help now, his eyes wide open and mouth stuck in a spasm of screams. He was definitely gone. I quickly turned around and walked back into the hall. I wasn't sure at first what to do, but I knew I couldn't let that crazy tweaker get away with this, so against my instincts, I called 911. Even before the 5 showed up, I knew what they would do. Once they had ransacked the trailer to their satisfaction, they finally decided to find out who had done this to Larry. They wasted a large amount of time trying to pin it on me, but once it became clear I hadn't any reason to do it, they started looking for Shonda three hours later. I knew I shouldn't say I was shocked, but the cops found her relatively quickly. It helped she continued to walk the streets for hours in broad daylight, holding the weapon, while being coated in blood, but hey... Even a broke clock is right twice a day. She was so warped and out of it, she asked for Larry for at least six hours after they brought her in. Since I didn't have anything on me except for the ones in my system, of course, they let me go. Obviously, I had no place to go, so I made a decision I should have made years before. I took a cab to my parents' place. At first, they were far from happy to see me, but once I told them I was ready to get clean and what the final straw had been... We had a big hug and a cry. They found a place they could admit me that evening and that's where I stayed for the next 90 days. The first few weeks were terrible and I thought about quitting more than once but each time I remembered Larry's screams of agony it made my agony weak in comparison. When I was released three months later I was welcomed back into my family and I'm proud to say that I've been a welcome part of it ever since. Now I'm not going to say there weren't a couple of trip ups but once I began counseling I was finally able to deal with my guilt related to Larry's death among other things. Twelve years on I'm a family man and a drug counselor at a county jail I once spent some time in and a year doesn't go by that I don't tell this story to each group I counsel. When it comes to Shonda she took the plea deal offered to her and ended up with a 40 year sentence. From what I understand if she keeps her nose clean and gets good time, she may be out in about 25. I hope she thinks about Larry every day for those 40 years and it motivates her to stay clean. I don't necessarily hold a grudge against her. Larry was far from a saint and gave out as much as he got. For all I know, he did something to cause a woman that he was well aware of was mentally unstable to end him. She never really said why she did what she did, but the reason is ultimately unimportant. A man died and did so in a horrifying way. So keep that in mind the next time you take the hit or snort that rail. Not everyone around you may treasure your life as much as you do, and just because you may call someone a friend, they might not be there for you when you most need them. I've spent a large amount of my free time lurking in this sub and have noticed how many of those here have been able to help other posters who have asked for it. Well, it looks like my turn has come to ask, and I really hope you guys can do the same for me because I've got myself into a bad spot and don't have a clue what to do about it. The final week of December, a waiter at work offered me the spare bedroom in his apartment. He'd initially used it for storage, but since his girlfriend had moved out, he saw no reason to let it sit empty. That night, my mother and I sat down and talked about it. I'd never considered moving out before. My mom and I had always got along fine, and I saw no reason to take on the expense. Besides, I was a big introvert and didn't do well with others. That's why I took the job as a prep cook. It meant I spent the majority of my shift alone. I'm not autistic or anything like that, my personality most likely spawned from being an only child with few friends. I guess I had gotten used to being alone. My decision was to turn down the offer until my mom suggested it may be a good way to draw myself somewhat from my shell. Despite my reluctance, my mother's advice had always served me well, so when I saw the waiter at work the following day, I accepted his offer and we shook hands to seal the deal. By the end of that weekend, I'd finished moving my things into my new room. The waiter, whose name is Devin, seemed a little shocked I had moved in so quickly. 
but I guess he thought I would wait until after the new year. I saw no reason to wait since Christmas had already passed and I never celebrated the New Year's holiday. He invited me to a party, but like I said, I never saw the point in the whole thing anyway, so I turned down the offer and wished him a good evening and a safe return. The next evening, we had a nice dinner and took the opportunity to get to know each other better. Following dinner, I turned in. At some point in the night, I was awakened by a light banging noise on the wall above my head. I laid still for some time and waited for the noise to occur again, but it didn't. Just before I could close my eyes, a long ray of light stretched across my wall. It looked like a flashlight at first, but when I sat up in my bed and took a peek out of the blinds, I saw a car with its headlights on reversing out of a parking spot directly facing my window. It seemed obvious to me that this was the source of light, so I laid back down and fell asleep soon after. When I saw Devin at work the next day, I mentioned the banging noise in passing and he said he hadn't heard it. He did bring up the light, however, and explain that car's headlights from the road often reflected off of something in our bedroom windows, and it wasn't anything to worry about. It did seem strange that he brought this up considering I hadn't mentioned it to him. I just nodded and went about my work, but soon after, I remembered that Devin's bedroom window faced the outer wall of another apartment block. How light could enter his window from that side left me a tad perplexed, but it wasn't an important thing to worry about and I soon forgot about it. Once my work was done, I drove back to the apartment. I'd undressed and was heading to the shower like I did every day after work and when I opened my closet, I noticed a few of my shirts had fallen off their hangers and onto the floor. This wasn't a big thing to concern myself with until I saw what appeared to be a shoe print on one of the shirts, like someone had knocked it off the hanger and then stepped on it. The shoe was much larger than mine and besides that, I didn't wear shoes in the apartment. The carpets had just been steam cleaned and I wanted to keep them clean as long as possible. Now I was starting to get anxious. I began searching my room to see if any more of my things looked out of place. Nothing else appeared to have been moved so I wrote it off as the result of an overactive mind and went about my day. The event that's motivated me to write this post happened this afternoon. I had finished my prep work early and headed home. When I came in the door and turned down the hall to my room, Devin came out of my room. Although I'm not good at reading others' body language, it was obvious I had surprised him. He asked me what I was doing home so early and I told him. I didn't have much prep because the previous night had been slow. He fumbled for his words and before he could say anything, I asked him what he was doing in my room. His answer was this. Oh, uh, I misplaced something and I was checking if maybe it was in your room, maybe. I asked what he had lost and after a few seconds of thought, he said it was a lighter. But uh, it's uh, not in there, I guess, so... I'm going to go in my room some more before I leave for work. Honestly confused at the whole way the situation unfolded, I just said okay. Before I could get the whole word out, Devin shot into his room and slammed the door behind him. I immediately went into my room to check and see if anything was missing or moved. Once I'd searched everything else, my dresser and even under my bed, I headed for the closet. Since I'd replaced the shirts that had fallen off their hangers, I'd know if they'd been knocked off again and... Believe it or not, one had indeed fallen onto the floor of the closet much like it had before. However, this time, there was a white powder similar to plaster dusted on the shoulders of a few other shirts and on the closet floor. This motivated me to search around the closet, under the carpet, the back wall, but nothing caught my eye until I looked up and noticed a square framed door in the ceiling. I'm still unsure what it is, but I thought if I could stand on something like a footstool, I may be able to open it and see what purpose it serves. At the foot of my bed, I had a wooden chair I used as my desk, so I grabbed it to stand on. I first checked it to make sure I was sturdy enough to hold my body weight, and it seemed to be. I carried it to the closet and stood upon it. As my face got within roughly one foot of the door, my nose picked up a foul and nasty smell I had never detected before. I started to push on the square board that served as a door, but something in the back of my mind, my instincts perhaps, told me to stop, so I did. I sat down in the chair and tried to make sense of it all and realized I had no idea what was going on. So that's why I'm here, posting the story. I'm at a loss at what I should do or how I should handle the entire situation. I'm very aware of how odd this all is, but 
I honestly lack the life experience to understand and resolve this problem, so I'm putting this question to you all. What do I do? About a week after my 21st birthday, I moved into a house with my brother and his childhood friend Devin. We were all old enough to drink legally, so we spent the majority of our time off from school getting blasted. I'd always been the lover instead of the fighter when it came to my behavior when drunk, and my brother was the same. I know from experience that some are instead the fighter, and when you run into one of them, it's the best policy to attempt to de-escalate the situation before it becomes an actual fight. In the following story, I discovered to my own detriment that sometimes regardless of how you act toward one of them, they only become even more angry and this puts you in a no-win situation. Devin had known my brother since he was about five and myself since I was about three. The two of us had never been close or even friends for that matter. For my part, I didn't hate the guy, he just gave me a bad feeling. Despite that, we were always able to get along with each other, perhaps for the sake of my brother. We'd avoided getting into a fight once or twice, but that was just because of kid drama crap. Nothing serious in any way. He had always been a stocky guy. Naturally muscular, you could say. Once he hit his teens, he shot up to around six feet, and at that point, I think he realized most people were scared of him. This fact seemed to make him even more rude and pushy towards others, and this attitude even extended to me. Everyone but my brother. Him being a pushy idiot was just something I had come to accept and it hadn't entered my mind since high school. Therefore, when my older brother Sean asked me to move in with he and Devin, I accepted right away. Sean and I had always looked out for each other and I enjoyed hanging out with him. He never got on my nerves and as far as I know, I didn't get on his, so this sounded like a cool living arrangement. We had a giant house party the first weekend after we all moved in and it was a blast. Devin was a bit of an idiot once he got drunk. He made a few demeaning jokes at my expense, but most of the people present at the time kind of blew him off. Like I said, everyone knew how he was. The possibility that he was going to be a problem started to show up that night. I'm not talking about the jokes towards me. Those mean nothing. This was much worse. Some little preppy kid with an attitude bigger than Devin had made some remark about my brother and Devin got up in the kid's face instantly. The preppy kid must have known he was in a bad spot because he made a quick back step and apologized to Sean. Despite that, Devin continued to talk crap to the kid until he was forced to leave. After watching this whole mess, I mentioned my concern to Sean, but Sean could only tell me to stop being such a wuss. He'd been making excuses for Devin our whole life and I should have expected this reaction, but this was a different situation as far as I could tell. We had to live with the guy. But as normal, my words were ignored. Happily, no other problems reared their heads that night and much fun was had by all. Waking up on the bathroom floor is always a sign of a great party, isn't it? Life went back to normal pretty quickly. Long days of classes and short weekends of drinking. Sometime in the middle of April, Devin and I had our first incident. Sean was out that night with his girlfriend so Devin and I were the only ones at home. We'd been playing games on our new PS3 and getting loaded when he decided to start calling me a wuss because I didn't want to take a shot of Jaeger with him. I didn't really like the taste of that crap and it made me sick, but that wasn't good enough for him. He began saying the word over and over again until I got sick of hearing it and told him to shut up. This was the worst thing you could say to him. He reached over and grabbed me with his right hand and pinned me to the floor. Now I know I've mentioned how big Devin was, but... I left out the fact that he was also on the powerlifting team at school and was strong as a bull. I, on the other hand, was a 140 pound, 5 feet 10 inch stick figure. As he held me there, he made it clear that I'll call you wuss as long as I want. You can't stop me, right? From that position I was in, I could only agree with him. Rough and, and a strangled voice, sure Devin, you're the boss. He let out a self-satisfied, arrogant laugh and let go of my throat. Once I got free, I had no interest in hanging out with King Idiot anymore. I walked into the kitchen and grabbed my 12-pack of stones from the fridge, watching the whole time in case he decided he wanted to pound me into the carpet. I took what was left of my beer and went into my room and locked the door. I could hear him out in the living room saying, 
Come on, idiot, come back out here. You little wussy. Ignoring him, I put on my headphones and watched YouTube for the rest of the night. Sean and I had to talk about what he had done to me the next morning. Actually, saying Sean told me to stop being a whiny baby would be more accurate. Judging from how he reacted toward me before when it came to Devin, I shouldn't have been surprised, but since we were brothers, we were supposed to stand up for each other, we always had. I made the decision that I wouldn't drink alone with Devin again. He surely wouldn't do that sort of crap to me in front of Sean, but I was wrong. The next time I had a run-in with Devin was also the last. It had been several months since our last episode and I'd done my best to put it behind me. But if I'm honest, I was still a tad nervous when I was around him, but I felt safe as long as Sean was with us. Like normal, we had been out drinking that afternoon and had continued to party back at home. If I remember right, we were playing a game of drunk scrabble and the thing that set it off was my correcting of Devin's spelling. He had spelled the word subtle as S-U-T-T-L-E and I made the grand faux pas of pointing it out. Like I said, we'd been drinking all day and my guard was well and truly down. I don't want anyone to think that I was being a know-it-all, but my intent was to follow the rules, that's it. But when I pointed it out, Sean emitted a short burst of laughter and this angered Devin. Naturally, he couldn't get mad at the guy who'd laughed at him. Instead, he sat up and reached across the table and knocked me on my backside. I fell back so hard I hit my head on the floor. So hard I ended up with a mild concussion. When I stood up, I looked over at Sean, but he acted as if though I had fallen myself instead of getting knocked over by his best friend. This made me mad and I confronted him, but his only words for me were, It's your fault, man. You asked for it. Should have kept that crap to yourself. Indignant about what Sean just said, I looked across the table at Devin and he just gave me his usual smug grin. This was the last straw. Any guy who wouldn't stand up for his brother isn't worth crap. The next morning, I started moving my things back into my room at my parents' house. Of course, Sean tried to talk me out of it a few times, but I had nothing left to say, and he knew it. This was only a temporary measure until my girl and I could get our own place. We did a couple of weeks later, and other than a handful of times at school, I never spoke to Devin or Sean again. Some of you may criticize me for cutting my brother out of my life for something such as this, but think very hard. Isn't the job of an older brother to protect his little brother from other people, especially bullies, regardless of their age? If you witnessed another man, a much bigger man at that, strike your little brother, wouldn't you at least say something to that bully? Well, folks, this happened to me multiple times, and my much larger brother let the bully strike me and did absolutely nothing. Actually, you may say that he openly encouraged it. So my view is that if your family aren't willing to help you and freely choose an outsider over their brother, a person who they grew up with and share blood with, you owe them nothing. This tale I've shared with you occurred almost 12 years ago and Sean and I still have not spoken. My family, my wife, and three sons spend holidays with my mother the day after he does. I told my mother to tell him if he wants to renew our relationship... All he has to do is cut that cancer Devin out of his life. We could put our past where it belongs, but he apparently feels his friendship with Devin is more important than knowing his nephews. That's his choice, and I refuse to let it hold me back. This misfortune that managed to separate two brothers who once loved each other has been an important lesson to me, and one I have been determined to teach my sons. Be it son, brother, or dad, no one should ever choose someone who is in the wrong over their own blood. The names and locations in this post will be changed in order to preserve the privacy of those involved and to avoid any further pain associated with the incident. Some will believe this is a cop-out, but unless you were there when it happened, You'll never be able to understand how something like this can destroy a person's ability to move on with their life and have a meaningful future. When the time came for me to go off to college, my mother insisted I live in the dorms for at least my first two years. She said this was an essential part of the college experience and the friendships I made would last forever. I didn't bother to remind her that none of her friends from school still contacted her. It was more likely one of those greatest days of our lives sentiments that you see in movies like St. Elmo's Fire. After all, she was about that age. 
I attempted to get the idea across that it was not like her and didn't get along with other girls, but she quickly poo-pooed the idea and accused me of being a prima donna. Like usual, her desire to relive her sorority days through me left me with no say in my living situation, and I found myself living in a musty old building with a bunch of hyperactive brain-dead girls. My first day at the dorms, I met my roommate. For the sake of the story, I'll call her Sybil. She was a quiet, shy, and cute little girl that said very little, so thankfully she wasn't as bad as I feared. I made it clear to her from the start that I was here to learn and get my degree so I could start living my real life and was in no way interested in partying and chasing frat boys. She simply said, okay, and with that simple one word answer I knew we were going to get along just fine. School was almost exactly what I expected it to be. Juiced up pretty boys and overly aggressive feminists complaining about everything under the sun. I did my best to block out all this chaos and focus on my studies. As far as I could tell, Sybil was trying to do the same. She did voice her concerns the first week of classes, saying they were harder than she expected, but didn't say anything else about the subject again. Other than when I returned to our room at night to sleep, I saw very little of her the first month or so. The loud cheeriness of the other girls drove me to do my studies in the library, a place I soon fell in love with. When semester tests ended, I was free to spend more time in our room and talk to Sybil about her school experience so far. The girl I had met a couple of months ago was very different from the one sitting across from me then. The stress of school was obviously affecting her psychologically. As I talked to her, she would mindlessly twirl and pull her hair out from the root, Every other sentence lacked any sense and as she spoke, she grew more and more uneasy. I mentioned my concern for her but she acted as if she didn't hear and continued her agitated rambling. Tomorrow everyone would be going home for the Christmas break and I convinced myself once she returned home her health would improve or at least her parents would get her the help she needed. Despite feeling guilty about leaving her alone, I had a few things I had to get done before I flew home in the morning. Returning to our room an hour later, I was relieved to see Sybil asleep in bed. Doing the best I could not to wake her, I finished packing my luggage and soon turned in myself. I'm not sure how long I'd been asleep when I was awakened by a banging noise across the room from me. Once I was able to open my eyes and comprehend what was happening, I saw a dark figure on Sybil's side of the room picking up suitcases and folding clothes. Turning on my bedside lamp, I quietly asked her what she was doing. Packing for my trip, honey. Go back to sleep. Sorry I woke you. This made no sense to me. We had plenty of time to get ready in the morning before we had to be out of the dorms. I initially thought I had overslept or something, but the time on my clock said 3.23am. Are you having a hard time sleeping or something? You can do that crap in the morning. Once again, she ignored what I said and continued to pack. Picking up her large suitcase, she placed it on her bed and took her smaller one from the floor by her feet and stacked on top of the other. When I saw this, I became more confused. Sitting up in bed, I started to ask her again what she was doing, but before I said a single word, she turned to face the window, raised her hand, and swiped in one quick, smooth motion across her throat. She let out a loud gurgle and dropped to the floor next to her bed. It wasn't until her body hit the floor that I realized what she had done. Blood bubbled from her throat and mouth. I couldn't do anything but scream, loudly and over and over. I watched as the color drained from her face. Her hands slowly opened and that's when I saw the small piece of razor that she had cut herself with. I'm not sure when the other girls entered the room. I was entranced by the lifeless look in her face but the scream of another girl in the room snapped me out of it. Annie, one of the girls living at the end of the hall, ran in with a towel and pressed it to her throat, but it was no use. When the paramedics arrived about ten minutes later, they pronounced her dead. At some point, a couple of the girls in the dorm walked me out of our room and sat me down on a chair in the hall. The rest of the night and into the next morning, I remained in a state of shock. The school brought in grief counselors that morning to talk to everyone. Many of the girls did but I stayed in a stupor until my parents flew out to escort me home that afternoon. I'm thankful to all the girls on our floor that helped me and contacted my family and explained the circumstances to them. I had grossly misjudged many of them and 
For that, I'll always be sorry. My mother had proved correct. At least in this case, I was being a prima donna. The afternoon before my parents and I flew home, I had to speak with the detectives investigating this. I did my best to describe what had happened, despite how hard it was. They did want me to know that I shouldn't feel responsible for it. Her parents had told them that Sybil had said many times on phone calls that she was homesick and was having a hard time with her studies. She was from a small town in Missouri and going off to school had been a massive dose of culture shock. Add that to the fact that she was failing most of her classes, the pressure must have all boiled over. Regardless of what the detectives and my parents were telling me, I couldn't help but feel a large amount of complicity in her death. I had spent so much time worrying about myself and ignoring the actions of others that I missed her slow descent into illness. I'm not sure if she had needed someone to talk to, I would have been the right person. My smug attitude towards the others I shared the campus with had made me a miserable bore. When the time came, I chose not to attend the funeral. I was sure the last person her parents would want there was the roommate that ignored their daughter's illness and had not even bothered to mention her strange behavior to anyone. I made the excuse to my parents that Missouri was too far away, but that was the truth of why I didn't go. The idea of returning to that particular school was beyond possible. The thought of all the accusatory looks and glares was too much to handle. I decided to take some time off and deal with what had happened. The next six months was spent in counseling, in group and solo. This helped me deal with my guilt surrounding the event and overall improved my attitude towards others. Three years later, I'm in my final year of college at a small local university just a short drive from my parents' house. All this time later, my mother has begun to accept that I'm my own person, and I have come to the realization that I was far too immature to move across the country and go to a huge college filled with strangers. The bad attitude I had towards others was a self-defense mechanism to hide my insecurity and fear of being so far away from home and those I loved. That had been the way I handled it, and unfortunately, Sybil dealt with hers in her own way. Sadly, her way cost far more than mine. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.